<laughs> what was the different one? Uh, no, I no, I, I thought we could, you know, yeah. um, use coffee. I'm cup trying to think of what the right extension would be for that. Yeah, so I, anyway, uh, you have this, uh, you have this initiative uh, to encourage this activity, and yeah. so you think what I need is a domain name because I want to make a website that has content on yeah. it and explains this idea. And so you would go to a retailer to buy a domain name. They're known as a registrar in the industry. And they're basically like the corner store where you go and buy anything. And on their shelves, instead of cornflakes and milk and everything else, they have domain names. And so you would go and type in a little search box. Uh, you would like showerpea.com, perhaps. Sure, yeah, yeah, perhaps. Sure. Yeah. Uh, or conservewater.org. It's probably or something. taken. Yeah, yeah, probably taken. And you would uh, type it in and you would hit search. And most likely, it would say, well, in most cases, but maybe not for this example, it would say, your domain is already taken. And so you'd search for another one, and eventually you would find one that was actually available. Now, in the background, what's actually happening is that that registrar, that retailer, is going and checking with someone to see if anyone has actually ever registered that domain name yet. So they want to see if it's available. So they go and check and see if there is uh, availability for that particular name, and if it's not, they say, you're out of luck, guess again, and if it is available, they'll sell it to you. So you provide a bit more information to them, your address, contact information, technical information, they take some of your money, and you have that domain name to use for any purpose you want for usually a length of time that's one, two, five, up to ten years. And so what happens upstream? <laughs> no pun intended, sorry. No. Uh, what happens upstream of the of the retailer, right? Of the corner store I buy from. Right. Yeah. So once that domain name is sold, then the wholesaler makes a note in their big list that says this name has now been registered. So if anyone else was to go to any other registrar and search for that name, then they would ask that wholesaler, they would check with that list to see if there was availability for that name, and it would now come back and say, no, there's not. Has anybody in the room found, as so we uh, uh, started Calculate in 2003, and we registered Calculate.com, and we bought we bought it, and we paid a premium price for it. Do you recall? Yes, $400. $400. We, we live in Ireland, so it was 300 Irish pounds before the euro. $400. So has anybody, and that felt like a lot of money at the time, but has anybody declined, has anybody tried to buy a domain and found it to be, the price to be too expensive or totally obfuscated? Yeah, right, like you just yeah. like, I, I don't know what the price of this is, right? So um, why are they priced the way they are? Why, how are domains priced and why did, was Capulet.com cost us $400 in 1993? Right, yeah. So. That wholesaler that the registrar or the retailer is checking with um, has the right to set the wholesale price for the extension that they manage. So if you are registering conservewater.org, for example, the people who run .org that maintain that master list of every .org name that's registered set the wholesale price of .org names. So when a retailer, a registrar, puts it on their shelf, they decide what the price is that you see by putting a markup that's maybe 30, 50, 100% on top of that wholesale price that's set at the registry level. And then when you actually go and buy conservewater.org, then the wholesale fee goes back to the people that run .org, and the margin on top of that goes to the retailer. And in most cases, for most domain names that you're looking for, you will just pay that price. But there are some names that are higher value, that are more in demand, that are better domain names, that have already been purchased, and someone is holding on to and is happy to resell. So just like a used car. They can resell that domain and pass it on to you. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, in most cases, um, where you run into that, you have somebody who has a portfolio of names and they've collected these names over time because they see them as being valuable and they are reselling them to other people at a price that they have set. Basically in an aftermarket, just like going and buying a used car. And I'm sorry, are they holding it, uh, have they bought these and held them like real estate for years? Or maybe they just bought them yesterday? Or? Yeah, exactly. Many um, 
domain investors would have a portfolio of thousands of names that they might manage, just like real estate. So they would be looking for keywords, uh, valuable search terms, uh, short names, uh, misspellings of names, uh, anything that's going to get traffic, basically, or might eventually have a market. So uh, I, I want to dig in a little bit more about how they're priced, though, right? Like, you know, uh, we were looking at some art on the weekend, actually, and I just observed that, wow, like, this is the, the price of this art. is totally, that's another pun. It's totally abstract, but it's totally fungible, right? The price of this, just as the price of domains, right? It's this kind of virtual good. Right. And so um, the market just... How does it work? How does the pricing work <coughs> of these so-called premium names? Well, there are um, there are lots of domain extensions out there now. I'm sure we'll get into this mm -hmm. further in the conversation. But uh, one of the ways the market for domain names has moved recently has been for lots of them to price themselves at the low end of the market. So they want to sell you a domain for a relatively low price, get you to register that name, renew it year after year, and that's where they make their money. It's one of the ways that pretty generic, interchangeable domains uh, can compete with one another is on price. Other extensions might decide to price themselves um, at more of a premium price. Mm. Uh, there's a new extension called .bank, so it's aimed at financial institutions, for example. And if you were to go and register that name, assuming that you were a bank in this particular case, then you would pay $800 a year for that domain name. That's just the shelf price. That's not a markup like you paid for Capulet.com or anything like that. Mm -hmm. That's right where it starts when you go to the registrar and try and register it. So there's a huge amount of flexibility in terms of how these names are priced. There is no cap that's set on the price by the regulator or anything like that. Uh, there's another new extension, .xyz. They decided in their first year that they would give the names away for free. They charge a renewal price, but to start with, they're free. Mm -hmm. So that's a completely different model. So just to return to the question, the aftermarket for a second, mm -hmm. if I bought, if I happen to own sugar.com or something, something yeah. highly valuable, yeah. um, how would I find a buyer for that? Is there an auction, or what is the typical yeah. model? There are auctions, there are aftermarkets, there are, so these are organizations, companies who list domain names for sale. So if you had a portfolio of names, you might list them at one of these partners. These partners have tools that you can use. You might set it at a certain price and ask for bids. You might run an auction. Um, you might uh, have brokers try and find people that would buy that name. And uh, eventually, if you found a buyer, then typically, since these are valuable assets and you don't want to get scammed when you're paying money and trying to get this valuable domain name, they have some sort of an escrow system where you provide the money to the central organization, they get control of the domain name, and then they pass the two on. So a circumstance that you know we encounter with clients or with friends who run companies and organizations sometimes is they'll say, okay, we want conservewater.org, which is probably taken. And so they do the search and they find uh, the web page or within some sort of registry site, um, it says, make us an offer, right? And you know, how does one arrive at, you know, how does an average person, not somebody who's super familiar with, arrive at what price to make the offer at? And how much flexibility is there in the price? Or how much, is it all just negotiation? It's largely a negotiation. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are difficult. Um, it's a, it's very opaque, yeah. to be honest. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to try and negotiate for a name that somebody owns where it's just a make offer name. Mm -hmm. It's likely that uh, if you were just to go to them and say that you wanted the name, they would probably try and figure out who you were and how much money you had to spend on it. Mm -hmm. And so often people will go through a broker or some other proxy to try and get that name. Mm -hmm. um, and there's traditionally been a lot of scarcity on this market. A lot of the great names are gone, and or they're owned by speculators who are expecting to resell the name. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with some of the new extensions, one of the rationales for introducing the new extensions has been to create more choice in mm -hmm. the space. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so I mean, that seems like a good segue because we're kind of focused today on these new extensions or new top level domains. So maybe you can just like take us uh, back and explain what we mean by new top-level domains and new extensions, sure. how they compare with the old ones, and give us a little backstory on 
how this kind of uh, shift in the market happened. Sure. So if we go way back to 1985 or so, when the domain name system was first being established by John Postel and other engineers down in California. You had six, you had six computers to name. There's a great Planet Money episode about this. Exactly. And the first domain system was computers one through six at six different universities, right? That's right. That's, anyway, sorry, carry That's on. That's right. Yeah. And then they started thinking, well, what are some other uses um, that we might need to anticipate in the system? And they came up with a, a naming protocol, a naming system. And they decided to identify the first top-level domains, or TLDs. So this is the bit to the right of the dot in a domain name. So in the case of uh, Netsburg, Vancouver, net2van.com, .com is the top-level domain, TLD. So back in 85, John and his colleagues established com, org, mil, for the military. EDU, yeah, yeah, for, mil, for military, EDU for educational institutions, and a couple of others. And then they decided to create about 200 odd extensions for countries. These are the two letter country codes, or CCTLDs, country code TLDs, that we see today. .ca. .ca, for example. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, that was sufficient. But there was no technical limit to the number of extensions that could exist on the internet. And so around uh, 2000, 2001, the regulator in this space, an organization based in California called ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, <laughs> who decides what extensions exist and who runs them, who is the registry for them, decided that they would allow applications for some new extensions. I thought this is a platform for innovation, we should allow some new extensions to exist, there may be other great ideas that we're missing since John's first idea 15 years ago in 1985 where he came up with this somewhat arbitrary list of, well, there's probably going to be companies using the internet and probably organizations in the military, certainly, and... It was literally education. just a guy at a university who, like, devised the architecture that we... Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. yeah. And... So they open an application around, and that is where .info and uh, .aero, which you've probably never heard of, but is for aerospace and airplanes, mm -hmm. and .biz, is that dot biz yeah. and .pro came from that round, and some other extensions, .travel, .sh uh, .jobs How came in another round. How many were in that round? Oh, there are probably half a dozen. Okay. Very small. Nobody knew what the potential was going to be, but they, um, they launched. They now exist on the internet. Some of you may own names in those top-level domains. Mm -hmm. And then in about 2008, the community, because ICANN, this organization, is a multi-stakeholder driven organization that provides internet governance, thought that it would be uh, valuable to open up a new application round where people could apply for more extensions. They saw there was a lot of scarcity in the marketplace, all the great domain names were gone. They said this would be a great opportunity for innovation. People could think of new extensions that would be valuable for communities or particular types of activities online, these sorts of things. So they opened up an application round, and they got 2,000 applications for 1,600 different internet extensions or top-level domains. Can I pause the story there for a second? Yes. Why, in your opinion, have the second round of names like .biz, .info? I occasionally see a .info. I very rarely see a .biz. I've never seen a .arrow, I think. Why did those not like catch on or become more common? Well, I think it's partly a question of how good they are. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is how they were managed when they were first launched. Mm -hmm. One of the issues with .info was that uh, a lot of the names were given away for free or very cheap at the beginning. And so they were a perfect vector for people that were uh, running phishing sites or spam sites yeah. or anything like this because it was a completely disposable name, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time for the registry, the group that runs .info, to actually clean that up. There was also a question of how much these organizations actually invested in building a brand around these extensions and marketing why they were actually useful. And what was the advantage to having a .biz name? Was it just because you couldn't get the .com or was there some other 
benefit to having a .biz name. Mm -hmm. So they've not all caught on, but they still have a healthy number of registrations under them and are totally viable as businesses and exist today and okay. will probably exist in perpetuity. Okay, thank you for the cause. Now let us return to 2008. Yeah. And we have 1,600 different domains. And so just name some of those. Oh, uh, everything from dot .shop and dot .shoes to dot .app, dot .music, uh, dot .horse, uh, <laughs> dot .menu. Uh, and there's a, a bunch of brand ones. I know about dot yeah. .ford. My last name is Barefoot, and there was a dot .barefoot that Barefoot Wines acquired. It's true, much to your chagrin. Much to my chagrin, because I wanted Darren dot .barefoot, but unfortunately <laughs> yeah, it won't be, probably won't be available, because because a company has acquired that top level domain and That's probably right. will exclusively use it for their own wine wine sales. That's market. right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So and also cities as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in 2008, they started to develop the, the process of what you would have to do to run one of these extensions. By 2012, they'd accepted the applications. And as you say, they got applications from all kinds of different applicants. They got applications from communities, from individuals. There was someone who applied for their own name as a top level domain. So if you have a couple hundred thousand dollars laying around and you feel like owning your own bit of internet infrastructure, you could apply for Don't Dot Trevor. Darren Barefoot oh, next oh, time around. Yes. And we should specify, while we're accustomed to three letter domains, there's no uh, constraint on how many letters you can have after the no, yeah. Uh, there is technically a constraint, but for the purposes of today's conversation, dot construction and dot photography now exist online, and so it doesn't have to be three letters. Um, and indeed, extensions like dot travel exist already with, with six sure. characters. So what's the weirdest one you can think of? Well, you've already stolen my joke. I was oh. going to say dot barefoot. Dot barefoot. But, yeah, yeah. but actually, uh, the other one that I found today um, when I was preparing for this was dot duck. Dot duck. There's yeah. a dot duck. And it's owned by SC Johnson. Like the company that the company that makes cleaning products <laughs> products and things. Do they so have the only thing that I could possibly think of, I didn't do any further research into this, but this may relate to your shower game site. Uh, was <laughs> the toilet dot duck. Uh -huh. Because isn't that a toilet cleaner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Toilet yeah, duck? yeah maybe they I think it's owned by SC Johnson, then maybe that will be the domain name that exists at at dot duck. Yeah, yeah. My, one of my favorite is dot sucks. And I like dot sucks seems like a great business model because every corporation is going to take the defensive step of buying their own, like you know, Johnson SC Johnson dot sucks or Apple dot sucks, right? They're just going to take that step to defend against that, right? So dot sucks is pr priced very aggressively. Uh, dot sucks is uh, proudly run by a Canadian company oh. out of Ottawa, mm -hmm. and uh, they. Uh, raised the ire of all sorts of IP lawyers and <laughs> policy makers yeah, yeah. of whether dot sucks uh, was uh, a shakedown mm -hmm. uh, or whether it was actually mm -hmm. part of um, a campaign for free speech, sure. essentially. Mm -hmm. So this is potentially a feedback site or there are other ways that this domain could be envisioned. So all sorts of people came to the regulator with applications for all sorts of different extensions. Yeah, okay. And so uh, roughly 1,200, am I correct in saying? About 1,200 have been, what's the term? What's the verb there? Well, delegated, delegated but launched, okay. released onto the internet. Okay. And I'm interested, so you're the co-founder of Dot Eco, one right. of these 1,200. Yes. And Dot Eco is in a kind of subset of a subset. And I think it's, it's valuable to talk about these two, two aspects of, of Dot Eco and other domains like it. And one, your application was community-based. Right. What is community? What was a community-based application, and what like fraction of all the applications were that way? And, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of getting a TLD this way? Sure. So, when my co-founder and I first conceived of the idea of applying for .eco, we thought, in order for this to be successful and valuable, it needs to be trusted, and it needs to have the input of the environmental community. So eco is a term that's been invested with a lot of value over the years by organizations that work on these issues and have created value in, in the term eco. It's instantly globally recognizable as related to the environment. And so was, we thought, a perfect extension that was related to the environmental community and people that were working 
on issues related to the environment or products or companies that had environmental characteristics. And you guys were both at the UN environmental program at that stage, am I right? We had left there by then, but that was how we knew each other, and that was where we first started working across industries or across sectors. So when we were there, we were working between the finance sector and the sustainability sector. And for .eco, we were finding ourselves translating between environmental organizations and internet policy makers to help both understand why there was value in engaging in this process. Okay. So you applied, so what I'm getting at here is you could apply as a community. That's right. And so yeah. Go ahead. you could, when you submitted one of these applications for an extension, you could either say, we're a totally standard applicant, we are just looking to sell these names to anyone who comes and wants to register them, and we have no requirements around any of the characteristics of our registrants, or we don't ask them to do anything uh, particularly special. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you would be a standard applicant, and if there was more than one party that applied for that extension, then the regulator would decide who was going to get that extension by putting it to auction. So this is just like wireless spectrum or lots of other public goods are allocated. It goes to the highest bidder. This is actually how .web was settled. So there were 10 or 12 applicants for .web, and eventually they went to auction, and it sold at auction for $135 million to VeriSign, who is the registry behind .com. I see, I see. So, so we did something slightly different, mm -hmm. which was there was a, another track in this application round. A lot of the internet and internet policy has been developed by communities. Mm -hmm. It's a very multi-stakeholder process. It's very amenable to the idea of communities. It's been communities of engineers and policymakers and others who have helped shape the internet into what it is today. So one of the ideas that was captured in the application process was that we should find a way to recognize communities or communities of interest and we should give them some level of priority in the application process such that if they really do represent a community then we should use that as a signal for how we allocate that extension. We should use that as a key criteria for how we allocate the extension. So in the case of .eco, we convened a group of about 50 of the world's largest and best known environmental organizations like WWF and Greenpeace and IUCN and Suzuki Foundation and others. And they all got behind, we had some rules around how .eco could be used or what you had to do to register a .eco domain name. And the .eco was an extension that was highly relevant and applicable to this community. So there was some value that we could put back. And so, fortunately, we were able to convince the regulator of that. Maybe just, I'm sure you're reluctant to tell the story, but uh, in the media, when the media covered the .eco process, there were two major figures cited as kind of fighting it out for uh, the uh, .eco domain. What's that story? It's true. We inadvertently walked into a much more interesting story than we were expecting, which often happens. Mm. And uh, we did have a couple of other competitors for .eco. Uh, one was a company based in Seattle called Donuts. They, probably called Donuts. <laughs> the, uh, the Donuts folks applied for 300 different extensions. They raised $100 million to start their company. They spent $56 million just on application fees to apply for these 300 different extensions. And they applied predominantly for valuable keywords because that was their expertise. They knew what words were valuable online, so they decided to apply for as many as they possibly could. And they got lots of them. Mm -hmm. They're one of the biggest operators of, of uh, internet extensions now. One of the other applicants was a group out of California, and for a period of time, they had the support of Al Gore. Vice President. The former Vice President of the United States, and a well-known environmentalist. So, we had this coalition of organizations. But on your team, on our side, on your team, you had somebody else. We did. Yeah. And they had Al Gore. And on our side, one of the organizations that we had approached and had supported us was a group called Green Cross International. And the chairman of Green Cross International was none other than 
Mikhail Gorbachev. So it didn't take long for some industrious blogger to get wind of this and start to set up the Cold War Part Two of Gore versus Gorbachev, fight to the death over .eco. So we'd stepped into a much higher profile, uh, higher stakes game than we had ever anticipated. Uh, over the long run, uh, we were able to keep the coalition together and uh, in the end, win the rights to, to .eco. But that day. certainly was one of the ways that we got a substantial amount of coverage for the application when we were putting it together. Absolutely, absolutely. And time permitting, I want to talk maybe at the end about the power of a TLD and how orgs, organizations might consider replicating what you did for their own, yeah. time permitting. So, um, but I want to get kind of into the, the, the landscape of TLDs and what it means to people running organizations now, right? So if you're, if you are starting an organization like my water conservation organization, or if you're starting a new, uh, you know, microsite or starting a new campaign, all of a sudden you've gone from like, okay, we're a nonprofit, so we're going to be .org. We're just going to, it's going to be .org, full stop. Yeah. So like now, many, many other options, right? In a nonprofit space, I, I can think of .eco. I can think of .ngo, .earth. Um, there would be other probably common domains like maybe dot water or something like that or for sure. different issues. Or there's even other uh, more creative ways that you might use new extensions. There's a dot watch that exists, for yeah. example. And one of the things that advocacy organizations do is watch. So if you had some sort of water watch yeah. or climate watch, climate yeah. watch or something like this, you yeah. can imagine climate dot watch being a great name for them. It has yeah. nothing to do with wristwatches per se. Mm -hmm. Or uh, justice dot justice is another one that yeah. You might put a word in front of them. So like, how should people think about this, right? Like it was a, a relatively, basically right of the dot was easy, and now left of the dot is hard, and right of the dot is yeah. way trickier now. Yeah. So how should people think of that right of the dot, would you advise? Well, I think it's, it's first important to recognize that there are a lot more options out there than used to exist. So if you... If you initially gravitate to .org because that's sort of the, the muscle memory and the search for domain names, it's worth taking a step back and thinking, I can either have potentially a, a long and difficult name in the .org space, or I might want to think differently about how I use a, another new extension. So just knowing that these exist is one thing. And then thinking about how you're actually presenting your organization online and what the message of either your organization is uh, what the campaign message is, and what the most appropriate domain might be for that particular campaign, or how you might want to rebrand how you're positioned. Right? You may be able to find a name now that's more closely aligned with what you do than just .org, or whatever else you have right now, .ca. There may be some other message that you want to be able to tell in that extension. So it's an opportunity to think about those things, and think about the different contexts that you might want to use them in. So instead of just having your organizational address, having a whole portfolio of names for different campaigns using different extensions that are best suited for different contexts might be a way that you take your strategy forward. If you think of a new domain, actually let's just ask quickly, has anybody in the room seen a, like a brand new, like a new top level domain in the wild? Yeah. What, do you remember what you saw? Um, dot finance. Dot finance. Yeah. Dot global. Dot global. Mm -hmm. And to your point of dot bank. Um, uh, dot credit union. There was only one applicant, and that's coming. All oh, right. Dot credit union. Yeah. yeah. I also use dot global all the time. We also see dot club, which is really intriguing to me. Dot club. Yeah. 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 I keep saying this uh, anecdote, but coffee dot club sold for a hundred thousand dollars apparently. It did, and yeah. .cloud has actually been one of the most successful new extensions to launch. You can imagine like Nescafe.club and, I don't know, Wine.club, Price.club, Price yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so in thinking, in helping orgs through this decision, like I kind of perceive, uh, two, right now I perceive two sides of the coin, right? On the one hand, it's like, you know, quite kind of sexy to get like water.watch or something. And that's quite cool, and it kind of piques people's 
people are like, oh, look, that watch. I didn't even know that was a thing. Because we're like, the world's still being educated about domains, particularly ones that are longer than three letters. Yeah. And, but on the other hand, there's the like, oh, water.watch, that's just clever design. It's not a URL. You know, where do you think we are right now in terms of like education and people understanding the landscape? Uh, really, really early days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are lots of applicants for new extensions who I think expected that all of a sudden they would sell hundreds of thousands of names in their extension and everyone would start using them and know that they existed. And in actual fact, this is a very long-term adoption curve that I think we're going to see. To start with, people's domain names are really sticky, right? When people register a domain, the domain renewal rates are over 70%. So chances are, when you register a domain, you're going to keep renewing it. Either you're using it and you've got a website and you've got email attached to it and a bunch of other infrastructure that's tied to it, or you think, well, I'll use it someday. I'll just pay another 10 bucks and maybe next year I'll get around to sure. launching my NGO. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I think people are going to, uh, in terms of rebranding the organization, I think it's going to take a long time to get there. Mm -hmm. I also think that it's only when you see more and more people starting to use these extensions out in the wild that people are going to get used to seeing them, mm -hmm. recognize them as being credible, and recognize them as domain names. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, we'll see where we are five years, ten years from now. These are, uh, these are not overnight successes mm -hmm. in, in most cases. So this, this pertains to this. It's kind of a two-part question. I want you to talk a little bit about what I understand they're called maybe validated or verified. Validated is the right word, maybe, or TLDs, right? Like .bank or .eco, right? Yeah. And, and then uh, wrap into that maybe, you know, for me, if I was advising a client, I'd probably be like, don't, don't get, like, even five years ago, I'd been like, don't get .info or .biz because they feel sketchy to me, right? You know, you mentioned .info is like a kind of phishing site, right? Uh, no offense if anyone's got .info or .biz in the room, but th that's like some of the body language of those domains is that. How today or going forward in the next couple of years, people buying domains, how are they gonna understand the body language, of this, what these new domains signal, you know? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Lots of these extensions have evolved over time, right? So we have a different conception of a lot of these extensions from when they, from when they launched. There is, you're right that, uh, there are a group of new extensions which have registration restrictions around them. There are already extensions which have registration restrictions around them. The one that we're probably most familiar with is .ca, for example. So in order to register a .ca domain name, you need to be a Canadian citizen or have a Canadian incorporated company organization or these sorts of things. There are certain criteria that you need to meet. And for the different extensions, they have come with different business models around how they can be most successful or create the most value for their customers. In the case of .bank, which was actually another community applicant, like we talked about before, they brought a group of financial institutions together and the international bodies representing those financial institutions and said to the regulator, we think that .bank should exist and it should be managed by us. The reason it should be managed by us and have some restrictions around it is because we need to convey trust to consumers that the site that they're going to is an actual bank because we don't want the mass confusion that could exist if people end up at sites that are not actually banks. So you can set the rules as the registry or the operator of these extensions around who can register, who cannot. And there's an opportunity in setting those rules to help to garden or curate that namespace mm -hmm. and try and create a level of trust there or some credibility. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a dot secure that launched, there's a dot trust that launched. Mm -hmm. These are all sites that are trying to communicate something through that domain name. And so you're constraining dot eco in this way as well. We are. Curating it. We're, we're curating it. We, uh, talked at length with the community about how best to operate this resource. How do we manage this most effectively to have an impact for the environmental community <coughs> and to help further the goals of the environmental community? And we said to them, there are a whole range of options here. We've got the entire spectrum of policy options in front of us. We can put no restrictions in place whatsoever and anyone can register a .eco domain. 
or we can make it really highly restricted and almost no one can register it. And there are pros and cons of both of those. You end up with what someone called the greatest opportunity for greenwashing in the history of the internet at one end, or you end up with a very small pool of registrants and nobody's ever seen a .eco domain name. They're mm -hmm. extremely rare and endangered. <laughs> so they, we all agreed to settle somewhere more in the middle and embed values of transparency and disclosure in how we're building .eco. Mm -hmm. So that when you register a .eco domain name, we ask people to create a profile, what we call the eco profile. And that's where they pledge that they agree with the goals and values of the community that they're joining, and they have an opportunity to disclose some of their additional environmental characteristics, maybe issues that they're interested in, or memberships that they have, certifications that they hold. That information is publicly available, and it allows internet users like you and I to go and see what the characteristics are of different registrants, what uh, the characteristics are of those community members that have registered names mm -hmm. in the .eco namespace. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like environmental NGOs that can register a .eco. No, exactly. One of the things that we wanted to create was a really open and inclusive space for all sorts of companies, organizations, individuals, campaigns, products for which .eco was a great indicator of the industry that they operate in, their characteristics, their orientation or focus as an organization, uh, your own interests as an individual, all of these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So that diversity makes the community much stronger and more diverse. And so we really want to encourage all those different types of uses in Maybe we'll wrap up. Uh, you did something as a top of the money gather that no one's ever done before with this domain grant program. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we did. So in launching .eco, we've tried to think about every way that we could benefit organizations that work in this space. And one of the ways that we could, thought we could do that was by giving organizations some of the first opportunities, the very first opportunities, to choose names that they saw as valuable in this namespace. We're at a stage right now with .eco where no domain names have been registered. It's a completely blank slate. So we gave organizations the opportunity to apply for any domain name they could think of. And it created a bunch of really great uh, applications for different keywords that they thought would be valuable. Where in the past, if you look at lots of the legacy or traditional TLDs that exist out there, those keywords would have long ago been bought up by a speculator or a company or someone else who was working in this um, in the domain name industry. And so this was a great opportunity to give the organizations an opportunity to get um, some of the great names that are out there. And also for us to identify names that were valuable to the community so that we could hold some of those names as the registry, and over time, make sure that those names go to the right homes, instead of just every name being sold to the highest bidder and ending up on the market. So we've tried to be thoughtful in some of those characteristics of the launch and some of the policies and, and processes we've gone through to make this happen. I remember reading, I read an interview with you where I think your co-founder said, I think in 2008 we were the only two environmentalists in the world that knew this was happening. Right? <laughs> They're like back in that day that you were like, oh, maybe we should do this because nobody else who has our like value system. Yeah, or, yeah, uh, it's approach. true. Yeah. It's true. What the one of the most challenging things through the process was uh, explaining to organizations why this was relevant to them and why, in a big picture sense, it made sense for the environmental community globally to pay attention to what was happening in this particular policy space and what the opportunity might be for the community to have a role in how .eco was built and how .eco was managed over the long term. So that's what we tried to establish and that was something that really resonated with them. Was mm -hmm. an opportunity to create uh, what we sometimes think of as like a national park online mm -hmm. or something like that. It's a curated space that's managed by the stakeholders in the space. Mm -hmm. So we've tried to put that structure in place and um, 
we do it in partnership with all those organizations that, uh, that have got their heads around something that is, in, in, in most cases, uh, not at all related to their day jobs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay, well maybe we'll do a question or two uh, from you folks before we wrap up. Anybody have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I promise I'm not an audience plant, but I actually got my eco the main today. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Uh, it's planetprotectors.eco. Protectors, well, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question was, the, what's, what's next for all these top level domains? Like, is there going to be another round? Is another 5,000 words? And is that just more complexity? Like, sure. the Repeat the question. Yeah, so uh, good question. So the question is, uh, what's next? Will there be 5,000 more new top level domains that launch next week or something like that, a new application around? What does it look like? So. Uh, there's two answers to that question. I think, uh, on the one hand, a lot of people who now run internet extensions that they have uh, just been granted and have now been running for some amount of time, because some have launched you know, a year or two years ago now, or one of the later ones to launch, may decide, you know what? I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. And they'll sell it to someone else. There will be some consolidation in the space. We'll see some shops gobble up some of these uh, extensions that other people don't want. And because they have the scale to add one more extension to their shelf, they'll run it at you know pretty, pretty low cost for them. And they'll do that. So there'll be some consolidation in the space. But there is talk about another round eventually. How quickly that happens, it's Hard to say. Like one of the things that I think members of the community would like to see and in the ICANN space would like to see are what are some of the outcomes and lessons from this application round? And where did we see the vast majority of applications from? Where were we systemically excluding applications from? There are very few applications from the south. There are very few applications. There are much fewer applications from outside of North America and, and Europe, right? So how could the program be structured in the future in a way that was more inclusive and created more diversity? So there will be another round eventually, I'm sure. The size of it will partly be dictated by how successful we see people are in this round and what models seem to seem to work and resonate. Your you asked a question earlier, but it's a complete tangent, and so I will stop there. <laughs> okay. Uh, Do you have a question? Yes. Um, Non-Latin script, mm, yes. top-level domains, yes. and to bring it to your house, uh, .eco is Latin script. Yes. Uh, more people speak Mandarin than English, or and so forth. Would you uh, consider, or have you considered .eco equivalent in Arabic script, in, Man, in Chinese script, in uh, Cyrillic. Uh, and I, I, I have a second follow-up, if, if, if I may. So one of the great advantages of this application round is that it accommodated what are known as internationalized domain names, so using characters other than Latin script. And in fact, I anticipated that one of the questions that you might ask me is, you're looking for trivia tonight, uh, was going to be what was the first new TLD that launched, right? And so I went and looked, and it's actually uh, the Chinese translation, Chinese characters for dot .games, right? And the first four or five that launched were uh, the Arabic characters for website, um, Cyrillic name, which I can't remember, I think it was for equipment or something like this. Uh, so the, the order in which things got launched was uh, random for the purposes of the conversation tonight, but it just happened that some of the first ones to be launched were uh, internationalized uh, names, and, uh, and that was, that was uh, very relevant to your to your point. One of the advantages of this round was allowing that to happen. I'm sure there will be more in the future 
as we see internet use expand you know, beyond the billions that are online now to so start to use other characters. So would you, would you, uh, would you uh, want to have a Mandarin equivalent of dot eco? of dot green, like whatever that is in, in, in context there. We definitely could do that. It's not something that we get automatically. There was a policy question when the application round was being launched about whether, say, dot com would automatically have the rights to dot com in Chinese characters, the equivalent, or in Arabic, or anything like this, right? And it was decided that they would be run completely separately and independently. So you would actually have to apply and go through the entire application process for that specific extension. So we could. We'll see how we do with .eco. Okay. The, the application, we should say the application process is like, it's ICANN is like the UN, right? So it it's like yes. $200,000 and like many years and... Hundreds of pages yeah. and yeah. many financials so, and operations yeah. and technical and all so that. I yes. can't imagine why you didn't do the other one. <laughs> yeah. Um, with the extension of new names, another round of names, are there any measures in place to prevent someone from registering dot equal or dot equal or uh, like no. kind of like building upon maybe a brand that gets put in place that's successful to then potentially delete it? Right, so the, the question was, in this next round, is it possible that people could iterate on existing extensions because they saw that by extending it, they could you know, get into that market as well? Um, it's uh, totally possible for people to do that, uh, and they may well. The problem has already been encountered in this round, actually, where uh, there were issues around that were very thorny to deal with, which were around plurals, mm. for example. Dot auto and dot autos, dot car, dot cars, right? dot shoe, dot shoes. Photo, uh, dot in many photos. cases, photo, photos. In many cases, those are run by entirely separate organizations who surely suffer all <laughs> sorts of interesting challenges in the marketplace to try and get their message across. Um, that's a reality that in some senses even exists um, with some of the legacy extensions. So for example, uh, .com is of course the best known top level domain. And when the country of Colombia decided to reduce or remove the restrictions around who could register a domain name that ended in .co, you might say that .com was uh, potentially irked by that because suddenly there was a two-letter extension which in many cases is seen as interchangeable with, with .com. You see co for companies in many different contexts. So there's absolutely lots of opportunity for that sort of confusion in the marketplace and new potential competition in the future as people see what areas are particularly valuable, or what industries or verticals. Yeah, we'll do two more questions, you and then you. Um, yes. Um, regarding the you only the slope, do um, you have a certain uh, requirements for organizations that have to register a main dot slow? You're uh, practically granting the dot slow from the domain. And so my question is, why would I trust you to run my business? And also, in the future, you might sell it over the, the coalition of the organizations you mentioned, that like they purchased the companies, you know, mm -hmm. might break or merge or somebody purchase them and the company change the requirement for, for registering the companies, you know. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting question and something we think about a lot. So 
When we first conceived of .eco and thought about how we should structure it and how we should put the governance in place around it to make sure that it was actually sustainable, we thought, how can we embed other organizations besides just us in the ongoing governance and maintenance of .eco, right? So this was one of the motivations for going out to the environmental community and these organizations and saying, can you help us run this? And would you like a role in how this is managed going forward? So technically, the community is written into the contract with ICANN such that if my co-founder and I and our company and our team go away, then the organization still has a role in how .eco is managed. In fact, their role is even more prominent than that in that they have the power as a partner in the contract to go to the regulator at any point when they feel like we're not fulfilling the goals that we had collectively identified and say, Big Room is no longer effectively operating the registry to the goals that we had agreed with. And we would be given an opportunity to fix that relationship, but eventually they could delegate it to another organization other than us in partnership with the environmental community to operate it. Just to, turn, just to say that again, what you're saying is you're the body of uh, companies or organizations, Greenpeace and blah, blah, blah. Yep. You guys suddenly misbehave, you start selling greenwashing sites to Exxon and Shell and this sort of thing. That group can essentially be like, we're taking this away from you, you're not operating this to the standard we want, and we're going to give it to somebody else who will do a better job. There are mechanisms where they can make sure that we do what we've committed to doing. And we're committed in the registry contract, the contract had draft was presenting a set of policies that required certain things of people that were registering .eco names. And we need to continue to implement those policies. And if we don't, we will not be in compliance with the contract. And there will be consequences to that. So that's sort of a, a bureaucratic, technical explanation of how We've tried to build resilience into the system and some durability and sustainability into the system. The other question is a really fascinating one that we're still trying to learn about, which is why do people want to register .eco domain names? Do they trust that experience? How can we be a credible yeah, trust. Exactly. Or eco logo that you see on all sorts of products. Or sustainable or seafood, or the ocean wise, ocean -wise this sort of thing. Exactly. Okay. So there are organizations that help to identify these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are professional associations and membership bodies who group uh, people who, or organizations or companies or products that have certain characteristics. And so when we ask for things from people, it's asking them to be transparent about things they're already doing, and we can help them communicate that and be a partner in communicating that and make it visible and higher profile and help them communicate in their domain name that they have these characteristics. So as much as possible, we're trying to build a system where we build on top of or leverage or amplify those things that people are already doing <coughs> and help communicate that, as opposed to creating a whole new standard that has a bunch of infrastructure around it that may or may not be credible and trustworthy. So our challenge then is who are great partners, who are great proxies, who are great identifiers in this space of who is eco-friendly and who is and not. Are they those, uh, those uh, identifiers, are they members of your organization? Are, do, they, do they have a .ECL domain uh, already? Do they have one? Uh, we can only just start to uh, let people register them and allocate them and things like that. So I expect that they that they will. And there are organizations inside the coalition that do some of those things, like ISEAL, for example, is an umbrella organization that works with leading standards bodies like WW, uh, like Forest Stewardship Council and Marine Stewardship Council and Better Cotton Initiative and things like this. And there are other organizations that are not necessarily part of the DITECO coalition that we will rely on and try and work with and partner with in the future to help expand that across the community. So final question there.
Uh, so when it comes to uh, top level domains, uh, how do you, like, is there a place where we can look these up and say, okay, for instance, dot and E is not taken for uh, businesses that are in the Middle East, for instance. Uh, is, is there a place where we can look these up and, you know, we could actually say, okay, dot and E now registered or uh, I can apply for yeah. Uh, so was it .me that you yeah. mentioned? Yeah. So in fact, .me exists, and it's the country code from Macedonia. And they oh, yeah. re recently rebranded, uh, sort of like .co, and uh, have uh, tried to brand the .me extension around personal websites and things like that, as you can imagine. When we lived in Morocco, I wanted yeah. to get oba.ma, because I we lived in Morocco. But, uh, you needed some sort of, there was some sort of uh, citizenship requirement or something that I couldn't meet as a short term. Right. But there was .ma right. was uh, Morocco, sorry. Right, yeah. So uh, there are consolidated lists of all the extensions that have been launched. Um, Wikipedia is one source, ICANN is another, uh, ICANN.org, I-C-A-N-N.org. And uh, you can also go to IANA, I-A-N-A.org which uh, maintains the authoritative list of who all of the registry operators are behind those extensions. So who the company is or the organization is that's responsible for running every extension that exists on the internet. But uh, the addition to that answer is that just going to a registrar or domain name retailer will not necessarily give you the authoritative list of every internet extension that exists out there because it's up to those registrars to decide which extensions they carry. It's like GoDaddy or this Namecheap. This is like GoDaddy and Namecheap and web names and Hover and all of these that exist. It's up to them to decide which extensions they want to carry and which ones they don't, either because they think it's too expensive or not great for their market or one reason or another that they might have. Mm. So that's actually the stage of the process that we're in right now, is to try and get .eco onto as many of those store shelves as we can, so that when people go to their favorite registrar, they, to the extent that people have favorite registrars, <laughs> they uh, find .eco names. Right. So for instance, if ME, some country, like some businesses in the Middle East, and they want to have a ME, uh, extension uh, based on the fact that ME is now registered for uh, another country, uh, how, how would they, or you mentioned that there are people who want to have personal websites with the .ME extension, how, how do you navigate among these issues that, you know, a certain number of characters could stand for multiple different things and we want to make sure that all of these things are matched? Yeah, well there is, there's different degrees to which the namespaces, as they're known, are really curated, right? So, for example, one of the new extensions that launched, which is you know, quite similar to Eco, is .bio. Right? So, in Europe, you think of bio and organic as being somewhat synonymous, right? Um, but their bio could also be for biography, right? It could also be branded as a personal site. or. Uh, quite some distance from dot .bio and organic is biotechnology, right? So that's a namespace that is trying to fulfill multiple different identities to different markets or verticals. And that exists all across the internet. And so the question then becomes, are there restrictions in a country code, top level domain, for example, around who could register? Are there residency requirements like .ca, for example, or has it been opened up so that there's more flexibility? Like and TV, dot TV. Like dot TV, it's yeah, great. Tuvalu. Or dot IO, which you see for lots of startups now. Who was, what was dot IO? I knew you were gonna ask me that. As soon as it came out of my mouth, I knew that question was coming. Uh, and it's for some very small islands called 
something. All right, um, let's wrap up here uh, as it's a Tuesday. I don't want people to go. I'm, first, I want to say I'm grateful that no one but me noticed the mouse that is running around the kitchen. Oh, you did too. Okay, good. But no one was like, eee! Uh, but is there one over there? Okay, yeah, it's just one. So uh, I'm glad that there was no shrieking or anyone. Like, I just controlled my shrieks, but, uh, but he's over there by the dishwasher right now, I think. Um, and thanks very much for, for listening, and thank you, Trevor, for giving us uh, all this education on the world of domains. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Trevor.